Kaffa, Rabbis Ephraim Goldberg, Philip Moskowitz, and Josh Brody are taking you Behind the Bema. The BRS rabbis schmooze about contemporary issues and talk to special guests who give a behind-the-scenes look at how they got to where they are and what keeps them going. Welcome to Behind the Bema. Good evening, good hour of Shavuot. It's Wednesday night, 9 o'clock. I'm Rabbi Ephraim Goldberg, joined by my dear friend and colleague, and superstar partner in Jewish life, Rabbi Joshua Brody, and we're here to take you... Behind the Bima. We're here to take you behind the Bima. It's a very special night. Tonight is Erev Shavuos. We're on the eve, the cusp of the incredible holiday where we're going to stand together arm in arm. We're going to accept and receive the Torah together. Tonight was an incredibly special program in Boca Raton. Rabbi Brody, where are you right now? What is that background? I'm actually in the Jewish Federation. I don't know any other Jewish Federation in the whole world that took its main theater where you have the graduations and the plays and turned it into a base medrash. Base medrash was set up for, you know, almost 300 people. And it was just a beautiful, beautiful show of achtas, of people caring for one another. How many people, how many were there? There were 300 seats set up. Maybe not every seat was taken, but it was really just a special evening to, uh, to show, to show that, that, uh, that unity. And, uh, what better night to do it? You told me. Let's do it. Before Shavuos. Tonight is the night. Matan Torah would be tomorrow. So That's amazing. Everyone, everyone I got to tell you, it was incredible. See a packed room of people. And um, that's it. The recreation of Har Sinai. All these different yeah. Jews. And united by Torah. Commonality. Torah. We're living in a polarized world so much that divides us. And it was a real unity night. A real celebration. Awesome. And U- Unity through Torah. Right? What, what, what could be better? Torah is the common language. Torah is it. And uh, it was amazing. It was amazing yeah. and special to be part of it and to learn and to connect and see the diversity in that room. The yeah. best part of it is that Har Sinai wasn't a one-time event because every time we open a book and study our sacred Torah, we are back at Har Sinai. But Har Sinai, the event was one time. But this partner in Jewish life, Jewish learning, is going to be going on every week at BRS. I can't wait to launch it. Can't wait to be part of it. But you can wait. You got to sign up also. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta I'm in. Up. 200, 300 people right. in a room every week who wow. are from different backgrounds, observant, non-observant, and uh, studying together, united by that common language of Torah. So exciting. Yeah. And it was just nice to see everyone really enjoy tonight. I mean, there were there were people. I mean, to, to make the, sh- the Shaduchim wasn't so simple, but yeah, the, the ones that worked really, really worked. I, you know, we said, oh, it's over. And, you know, I said, you can't really build a, a relationship in 30, 30 minutes learning with someone. Someone right. in the front row yelled out, yeah, you can. That's great. <laughs> It was great, those relationships. Torah is a great uniter. You know, we could focus on the things that divide us and we'll be divided, or we could focus on the things that unite us. And the things that unite us far outweigh the things that divide us. Far outweigh. We have a whole history. We have a whole destiny. We have a culture, a language. We have laws. We have a Torah. There's so much that unites us. It's just a question of what we're focused on. Yeah. It really is. It really is. Rabbi Sachs, we had some great clips of him uh, talking about Yeah, very appropriate. Tonight, we're going to have on Chief Rabbi Mervis, his predecessor, the great Rabbi Sachs. I will say that I'm so excited about Rabbi Mervis. He's a real scholar, and he's a true mensch, and he also is a visionary, and Rabbi Mervis is is amazing in his own right. But but hearing and watching Rabbi Sachs tonight, I, I really got emotional, because every time you think about how so abruptly he was taken from us, right? most of us didn't know just how, how sick he was. And, and he had so much more to say, to share, to articulate. He was such a unique voice, such a scholar, wow. so beloved by everybody. And, and you know, it's such a loss to be bereft of so many leaders, but Rabbi Sachs was just such one of a kind. And it just felt like there was still so much more for him to say and teach and inspire. It's a huge loss. Yeah, and it's funny because it, there's really been no one else that stepped into that, that space. That, that you could imagine all these different groups or organizations would invite him to speak because yeah. he brought everyone together. That doesn't exist right now. There isn't, it's hard. There, isn't that person. It's hard. there are people, there are leaders who really are in many ways irreplaceable. And it, uh, it's a big loss. Yeah. And it's a big loss. You're getting pumped for Shavuos. You ready? All set? Now, yeah. Well, now I got to start writing. <laughs> I mean, not write. I mean, putting together the shirim, but uh, Yeah, class of shir on Torah. It's a great Torah spurt. Right, yeah. it's like growth. This just outburst of Torah. It's exciting. exciting. No, it really is. I can't. I'm just. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited about Shavuos. Okay, we we made it through. Actually, I just don't. Need, you know what? I'm just wondering right now. Did I count last night? Did I miss on the <laughs> yeah. last night? Nah, you I didn't. 
We had a Marv, we had a Marv tonight at the end of the program. And that last night when you count 49 days, seven weeks, and you're like, yes, mm. did it. It's like the finish line of a marathon. <laughs> finish line of a marathon. I don't know if I get the last one of the broth. It's pretty close. See him on a you got it. See him it's on a and the it's it's super exciting. Yeah. Wow. You excited about Shavuos? What's what, 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 what I'm excited. Know? We got a great theme. In fact, I got I got a bunch of source I got my first one done. I'll be a long night here. Poker Tone Synagogue. Our theme is love. The power of love is the theme. Shavuos 573, 2023. Power, power of love. And all this year, and we got a ton of shear, not only through the night, but we got day, morning, afternoon, evening. We've got beginner, advanced. We got chaburas. We've got women's shear. We've got <laughs> the Sfardim stay up all night. We got the Nusach Sfard group doing their thing, and the and the Shtibel doing their thing. And we've got teen and youth, and 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 we've got um, a boys program and a girls program and family style learning. And there's just there's something right. for everyone. The question is not can you find your thing. It's it's are you are you looking because there's there's something for everyone, and that's always exciting. The theme of love, we're going to start out tomorrow night. My first talk is on on what is love, all the mitzvahs. What has love got to do with it? Is love involved in the Torah, the mitzvahs of love? And then I'm speaking about AI and love. Mm. Oh, AI. AI, AI chat GBT. You know anything about that, Rabbi Brody, chat GBT? Let me tell you, chat GBT. Since you introduced it to me on the show, that was the first time I ever heard of it, and I didn't understand it, so I started playing around with it. And I'm sure I'm probably not even scratching the surface, but in my own very small way, it has changed my life. I am, I am an author. I am a writer. I have ideas. They're my original ideas, so no one can claim that I'm taking sort of ideas I have in my head. I just can't formulate them so well. I throw them into this machine. Boom. Comes back. Amazing. I love it. And I've used it. Time and time again in the last few weeks. I don't have it. I haven't downloaded it. I don't want to be tempted by it. I'm not using it. You but don't need to. I'm, saying, but I'm getting a sheer about it. Well, okay. I'm just telling you because in the amount of time that it takes me to do the, the come up with the thought and, and, and write it, you're already writ- you're, you've already written the entire article. I don't know about that, but but uh, but my I'm actually, a lot of people are speaking about halacha and AI, and I'm not going that angle at all. I'm going a very different angle, which is how do we relate to God's love of us and our love for God? Meaning, I, there, there are all these articles you could look into it of of people who fell in love with bots and ChatGPT and AI. There are programs I won't even mention the names of these apps. They had a romantic notion to them. In fact, there were people who committed suicide, and there was mental health challenges that were introduced by people who, who were texting back and forth and really felt they fell in love. And and when the app changed the romance feature of it, and that was deprived of them, mm. they got incredibly depressed. So is God just like ChatGPT? Is God Kivi mm. is God Lahavdil like like AI? Because they talk about an AI God. AI could get to that point of knowing everything there is to know instantaneously and accessible and available to everybody. So again, Lahavdil, but the same way you could have a billion people who all put into chat GBT at the same time or use AI at the same time and it can respond to all. So is that Lahavdil God that all these people can pray and he can respond to all at once? But then is there no emotion? Is God just a robot? So what do we learn about love? What do we learn about God from AI? That's that's the next talk. And then we're doing one on how to love people who are in your family or, or your friends who are on a different derech than you, which is, I think, more increasing. People are navigating that, how to love the people in your family who are choosing a different derech than you. So we've got we got a bunch of uh, a few yeah. other, other like slots as well. To clarify on the AI topic here. There are certain people that have been given the gift that they understand how to use grammar. They know how to put together sentences and, and, and write. There are others, and it could be because, I, you know, JEC never fully prepared me. I don't know. That's just the way I feel. Maybe they did. Maybe they could have done a better job. Maybe I could have done more homework. I don't know. But I've always had thoughts that I like. I, I think I, I can express them verbally. When it comes time to put them in a, on a piece of paper, it never, never it works. works. For me, to be able to see a nice finished product, there is a book coming out soon. I'm going to have a book on the Parsha. My original thoughts. Oh, Rabbi Josh Brody and yeah. ChatGPT. We're going to do a book signing. It's going to be amazing. Also in the news, and then we're going to get to our, our esteemed, incredible guest, Chief Rabbi Sir Ephraim Mervis. Um, but I saw in the news today that our friend, former behind the beam guest, former Prime Minister of Israel, Naftali Bennett, and his mother sued a rabbi who um, publicly and, and went viral on that person's social media, 700,000 people, said, Naftali Bennett's this and that. He's anti-religious and he's miserable. He's not even Jewish. His mother's not Jewish. Mm. So good for Naftali and, and his mother, Myrna Barrett. 
and they sued this rabbi mm. and they won today or yesterday they won the rabbi at the end had to apologize admit he was wrong the the court is still going to decide the fine naftali has said all that money will go to charity he's not interested in the money and this is the part i'm proud of he said you can't just say whatever you want to say mm. you can't with an internet connection and a camera and a microphone just spew rhetoric and hate and say whatever you want to say, including falsehoods and lies. Wow. So he took down this first rabbi, and I happen to know he's going after another. Who really? that person? Yeah, I'm not going to use any names, but he's going I didn't after say another. Probably Bennett. Wasn't you? Someone who spoke about you and me, but he's going after another. I want to know: could we do a class action suit? How do I get in on this? Because I'd also like to hold them accountable. But you know, what? good for enough telly. I love that. You could look the other way, and who cares? And he's just spewing nonsense. But apparently, these two rabbis spewed such hate and venom and nonsense that it changed the search algorithm that if you put in like Naftali Bennett's mother, it automatically like adds like Christian or non-Jew. Wow. Meaning people can really negatively impact things wow. through lies. Like words matter. The whole sticks and stones, whatever that song or rhyme is about sticks yeah. and stones, it really does matter. And good for Naftali. And you know what? One by one. Anyone who says, oh, screen, are you saying if all of our listeners right now start saying that I'm, let's say, a chief rabbi, then in a few months it will come up on Google that I'm the chief rabbi? Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's try yeah. it. Let's give it a shot. It's all, chief by the way, America right now. Go for it. Let me just tell you something. Somebody very prominent who might be celebrating a simcha this weekend in our community told yeah. me for X amount of money, any rabbi could be made the most famous rabbi in the world with, with, um, I forgot the number he said was like like a million followers and be the best known and change. Yeah, for money, absolutely. You can do anything. Which is which is really disheartening to think that what you are consuming is not really by your choice. Like there's not free will. The whole thing is programmed and you know, we we have an air conditioning issue. We're looking at to replace one of our air conditioners. I was talking to Kevin on my cell phone about it, and then I go on my computer and I see an ad for air conditioning. Because it's listening. Oh, it's so Wait. weird. It's not weird. It's listening. It's not even debatable any, anymore. Your devices are listening to you, and then they are selling you right. based on you. And when you walk into Target, there's facial recognition of the store camera studying which aisle you went to and products you looked at, and then they're selling that data so that you're then on your computer, your phone, and you're being trying to be sold something else. I'm going to go into Target with a disguise. I'm going to get like a fake beard. and. <laughs> So I'm glad. Put on a mask of Rabbi Mafia. The, uni the Unabomber just showed up. Put on a mask of somebody else. Some tissues. Check some interesting aisles. Anyway, a lot going on. Bottom line is we got more shirim to prepare. We got a lot going on. What a privilege and an honor it is. Recently was the coronation. We spoke about it a little bit last week. You mentioned you didn't watch any of it. But no. a lot of pomp and circumstance and tradition and ritual. And we don't really relate to that here in America. But it's very interesting for the UK jury. And no one better to share about that than... Chief Rabbi Mervis, come to know him. We've uh, partnered on a few things, and really very special. It's got to be big shoes to fill to follow Lord Jonathan, Lord Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. But he's more than filled them. He's found his own pair of shoes, and he's making his own footsteps and making his own difference. And he's really a special person in his own right. And it's a real honor to have him on. Without any further ado, what an honor to be joined by Chief Rabbi Mervis. What a great schus, what a privilege and pleasure it is to welcome uh, the Chief Rabbi, Chief Rabbi Sir Mervis. Thank you so much for allowing us to go behind the bima with you from across the pond to spend time together again. Thank you for joining us. Shalom Aleichem. Lovely to be with you and lovely to have this opportunity uh, to have a nice chat. So Chief Rabbi, there's so much we want to talk about and discuss um, in terms of your incredible work and vision and a, a vision for the future of, of UK Anglo Jewry. Um, but before we do, very much still fresh in everyone's mind, of course, is the recent coronation of the king in which you played an unprecedented role uh, in participating. And certainly uh, we all watched and were enamored. I quoted you here in our shul um, and celebrated the difference between so many centuries ago, though, what happened to the Jews at a coronation versus your hospitality that you were offered and your participation. Could you share a little bit about what what that whole weekend meant to you, I saw from Havdalah the little video you made. But are you still are you still beaming with pride, and were you touched and inspired? And how do you think the experience of being present at that coronation will impact next Rosh Hashanah for you when we gather to coronate the King of Kings? <laughs> Actually, there was a joke circulating in our circles, and that is people were saying, 
well, at what point in the coronation will the, will the chief rabbi end? And they said, well, he'll try to get there by Hamelech. So, so, so that's Shaitin Yamim Moreli. But um, thank you for asking me. Uh, Baruch Hashem, I had an enormous zuchot to represent Jewish communities of Great Britain and the Commonwealth at the uh, coronation. And any kavod which was given to me did not relate to me personally, but rather it was me on behalf of Jews and Judaism. And we are blessed to be living at a time when in 21st century Britain, it is important that all faiths should be recognized and respected. And we are particularly blessed to have a king and queen who go out of their way to ensure that members of all faiths have the freedom to practice their religion openly and with pride. And it was in this particular context that the king and queen extended the invitation to my wife and myself to stay with them uh, in St. James's Palace, part of which is Clarence House, where the king and queen themselves reside. It's the same complex. And to provide facilities for us to keep Shabbat so that it would be in walking distance for me over Shabbat to get to Westminster Abbey. And of course, there had been a precedent because in 1902, Chief Rabbi Herman Adler walked from a synagogue to Westminster Abbey on a Shabbos for the coronation of King Edward VII. That was the last time that a coronation had been held on Shabbat. And of course, for us, uh, there are issues in halacha relating to attendance at a church service. And of course, how Shabbostic was this particular experience. But certainly, our Beitin and I had gone into the matter in great detail when there is an invitation from the Melech himself to attend. And very interestingly, you, if you look at the actual girsa of the invitation, it's King Charles III commands, and then your name, to attend. Wow. So when you have an actual tzivoy of the Melech, that's something which we accept. And in Halakha, it's important, Mishom Eva, that one should be present. Uh, and also on Shabbat, it was important that I be present. And as you mentioned, they respected our Shabbat regulations in a most extraordinary way. It really is. It really is incredible. And it is reinforcing for people who keep Shabbos and are inspiring others that you shouldn't have to compromise. We live in a world which is willing to, if we respect ourselves, other will respect us too. As high up as the king and queen who allowed the chief rabbi to participate without a microphone and offering hospitality and kosher food. And I think it wasn't only extraordinary about the king and queen, it's extraordinary about you and the statement that to reach those levels or participate, one need not compromise Shabbos. And hopefully that will give the confidence and courage to others to embrace Shabbos without compromise because we can participate anywhere. If, we're, if we take pride and we respect ourselves, others will respect us too. Now, did, did the chief rabbi have a relationship with, with Charles, now King Charles, before the coronation, what 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 was that personal relationship like when when the cameras are off and the the newspapers aren't covering? Is there a warmth? Is there a relationship that that precedes the actual coronation? So um, the first time uh, I met him was at my installation as chief rabbi on the first of September, twenty thirteen. We invited him to attend as Prince of Wales, heir to the throne. We didn't expect him to be available. Um, September is a time when the royal family is always on holiday in Scotland. Mm. You might recall that that was the problem at the time when Diana uh, died in a car crash. It was the end of August. It was during their holiday period and they were up in Scotland and would the Queen mm. come back to London and, and so on. There was that entire drama. Yet Charles at the time said, I will break off my holiday and I will come back to London for a day. Wow. for the uh, synagogue service. It was the very first time that a member of the royal family attended a shul service for the installation of a chief rabbi. And from that moment onwards, we established a, a very close rapport. Um, I visited Israel twice with him. Once was uh, when he went to the funeral of Shimon Peres, and the other, which was more significant, was a visit in its own right. Uh, when uh, he came on the 27th of January 2020 for the 75th anniversary uh, of uh, the liberation of Auschwitz. And uh, I accompanied him on various uh, very significant visits within Yerushalayim on that occasion. Um, and I've got to know him enormously well. You asked about his character. Yes, there's great warmth. 
Uh, and by the way, uh, Camilla as well, both of them show enormous warmth and uh, we've had some very special and precious moments together. And uh, literally just three days before the coronation, my wife and I were guests of the King and Queen at their garden party in Buckingham Palace, where we, we had great conversations in anticipation of the coronation. And um, But it's not special relating to me myself. It's the way he relates to all people and the way in which he wants to genuinely be the defender of all faiths. And with regard to the impact of the coronation and Shabbos, what you said before is absolutely correct. A lesson that I've learned time and again in my life is that the more that we respect our traditions, the more people will respect us. And we had a reception last week that I hosted um, for all the couples who have got married during the past year uh, under the auspices of my office, because all couples getting married in the UK need to register their message, their uh, marriages through our office. So we had an enormous crowd. And there was only one subject they wanted to discuss with me, and that was the coronation. Um, and I picked up on a number of really wonderful comments. For example, one couple said, when it comes to winter, we won't hesitate asking our bosses to leave early in order to get mm -hmm. home for Shabbos. Another person said, I've got an exam in university on Shavuot, and I was going to just go and write it. Thanks to seeing the consequences of respect for Yiddishkeit, I'm going to ask for special dispensation. People have been empowered, uh, and, you know, people are standing tall as you did today. And it's not just within the UK. I'm getting that impression that it just has a, a global impact. So let's take advantage of that sure. in order to enable people to know we've got so much to be proud of. And when we're proud of it, other people are supportive of us. Oh, for sure. Now, the question is, did the chief rabbi invite Charles or command Charles to come to the installation? That's the, <laughs> that's the real question. But I, I'm, I'm curious, actually, as an American, um, who admires and, and has enjoyed several trips to the UK, to, to England. Um, you know, our, our experience of watching the royal family is unfortunately today in our time and for this generation, a little bit of a reality show and, and headlines and the celebrity culture of, of the royal family and the challenges in it. Very different, I'm sure, than the, the British experience. And, and we have Brits in our community who I see the way they their excitement over the coronation and anything surrounding the royal family. I wonder whether, and, and originally, you know, from South Africa also is, is a different perspective that you come with. Do you think that British Jewry, do, does the fact that there's a monarchy for the country impact their religious experience in a way that we're missing in America? And I mean that throughout the Torah and Tanakh and, and throughout Gemara, one of the metaphors of Hashem is a melech, is a king. And for us in America, you could say president. Certainly we haven't seen presidents in that dignified light of late, but we don't see presidents as a monarch, as a king, pomp and circumstance and royalty and tradition and ancient traditions. And, and, and England does have that and the UK does have that. One of the things I saw about the coronation that I think is very good is the coronation was surrounded by tradition and ritual and ceremony. Much of it we don't relate to, it's unfamiliar, we don't understand, but the world was admiring. And that can only be good for the Jewish people, that our traditions and ritual and ceremony should, should earn the same admiration. So do you think, I'm sorry for the long-winded question, but the question is, do you think that the average um, Jew in the UK has a different experience with Hashem because they have the metaphor of Melech in a way that if you don't have exposure to royalty and a royal family and you're not a subject that you're lacking? So I think it's a great question and the way I put it is there is greater potential for a stronger connection with HaKadosh Baruch Hu's the Melech Malchem. Like it won't necessarily be the case but there is that potential. You know Chazal say Malchut Arake Malchut um, being able to to behold the presence of a, of a sovereign of flesh and blood uh, reminds us of the gadlut of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And also there is an aura surrounding a, a king of flesh and blood. Um, and I have felt it on a number of occasions. We were speaking earlier about the occasions in which I got to know Prince Charles as he was then. Um, and I remember the very first time meeting him when he was king. 
and there was a very different atmosphere. So the Queen had died, and uh, it was on the Friday between her death and the funeral that the new king, because he became the monarch instantly, he invited faith leaders to Buckingham Palace, and this was part of the schedule that had been pre-planned for decades before, because everything is planned well ahead of time. Um, and it so happened that it, it fell at the time when Shabbos was coming in, and uh, he rescheduled this event to take place before Shabbat so that I would be able to get home for Shabbos, wow. so that we could attend. And I, I'd always remember the moment he walked into the room, there were just about 30 of us, and he came into one of the great halls of Buckingham Palace, and when he stepped inside, there was an aura. You could feel it. You know, the Kamarai Masechet Brachot of Nur Chetamut Aleph tells us about Rav Sheshet, who was blind. And there was an occasion where the king went past, and Rav Sheshet knew the exact moment at which to say the Bracha, because he felt the presence of Malchut. And that is real. And I felt it at the coronation. I wasn't waiting for it to come. It suddenly hit me. When I had that zuchut of seeing the king and the queen right in my line of sight with their crowns on their heads, I just felt something extraordinary. And then you say, Allah had come over Chama with regard to Akadosh Baruch Hu and the zuchut that we've got three times a day, plus any other additional moments we want to stand before Akadosh Baruch Hu. So certainly our experience of the king of flesh and blood uh, can magnify our connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and with regard to monarchy in general, it's a system that does work. You know, people ask, is it a good system? And as you questioned, you know, what about certain standards of morality and, and life and shlombite that they might or might not have within their family circle? But let's have a look at the uh, national leadership of other great countries today. How well are the leaders shaping right. over there? Right. And I'd say, given all the systems that exist and the performances of various leaders, Vamey bin Yavin, I'd, I'd settle for the one we've got here in Great Britain. And certainly it provides an opportunity to set a tone for the people. And also what you were saying earlier is absolutely correct. We see timeless traditions making an impact on timely opportunities. Mm. And the fact that the coronation is steeped in tradition that's something that everybody picked up on. And it was a great advertisement for not inventing right now for the needs of the moment, but digging deep into our past to gain inspiration from the past for the sake of our future. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. So first of all, thank you so much. It's great, great, uh, big honor to have you on the show. You know, here in Boca Raton, we place achdus, achdut, unity as a as a as a priority. We really try our best to to bring different rabbis and Jewish community leaders together, but we don't have a rabbi, a chief rabbi that's on the top, doing it and 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 making sure that that it happens. As as the chief rabbi of the United Kingdom, do you do you place that as a priority? After all, you're not a rabbi of of a shul. You're the rabbi of of, of the entire United Kingdom, and you represent every Jew. So are there things perhaps that we could learn from what you do? And how much of a priority is it to, to, to try and unite the United Kingdom? So we referred earlier to my installation ceremony in 2013. And in my uh, address that I gave at the time, I highlighted the importance of Jewish unity. Uh, for me, that is central. It is absolutely crucial. There is a lovely little idea. It, it is simple, but for me, enormously powerful, which I use often, and that's the origin of the Hebrew word for hand. So why is hand a yad? The reason is in each hand, you've got 14 joints, three in each finger and two in the thumb. That's a total of 14. 14 is your dullard, and that is yad. So that's the origin of the term hand. It, it's not a cute little idea. It's mamish, the origin. And when two yidden come together and they shake hands or they hold hands, You've got Yad and Yad, and that's the origin of the word Yadid, a friend. And Yadid in turn, 14 and 14, adds up to 28, which spells Kafchet, which is Koach. So the greatest source of Koach, of strength for Am Yisrael, comes from our Yadidut, comes mm. from our togetherness. Um, and, uh, you know, the Pasuk says, Why the word Gam 
and our Mephashim explain the gum refers to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, because when we are dwelling together in unity and in amity and in friendship, gum yachad HaKadosh Baruch Hu is within our ranks. And, you know, interestingly for us, we're still in the Omer. That's our Minhag Anglia. We go from Rosh Chodesh to Rosh Chodesh. Hmm. Um, and if one thinks about it, there's nearly two months of the Jewish calendar devoted to teaching us about the ills and the poisonous nature of Sinat Chinam, the whole Omer period, where the Talmidei Rabbi Akiva didn't learn from what happened at the Churban Abayt, the three weeks, Tzom Gedalia, and yet, after close to two millennia, we still, as a nation, haven't yet learned that lesson. And what is happening right now in Israel, I think, is exceptionally worrying. Mm. And throughout the Jewish world. So, yes, Jewish unity must be a, a top priority for us all. How do we practically pursue that? How, how do you bridge the gaps of the things that divide, right? The, the, the different denominations within Judaism and different levels of observance or different hashkafic approaches. And, and how does one navigate? The principle is, is beautiful and we agree, but in, in navigating it in practice, are, are there are there programs or exercises or projects that the chief rabbis initiated that we can learn from and, and replicate? So I'd say two things. First of all, family. If everyone within their own family circles would have Shalom Bayit and would engage with Ahavat Chinam, then the world would be different. But my second point, I have developed a particular approach which I, I announced publicly from the moment I became chief rabbi. Um, I don't know if you and your listeners are familiar with the sport called cricket. Um, and the way I present it is we all need to be batters and not bowlers. So I suppose in a mm. baseball contact, but correct me if I've got it wrong, we need to be the batters and not the pitchers. Would that make uh, sense? Yes. Okay. So we need to score runs for our team as opposed to trying to get the other team out so in this context when i became chief rabbi i declared no one would ever hear from my lips a public condemnation of other streams of judaism not to my right nor to my left nobody will hear me publicly criticizing reform judaism in private, I would make my views clear, and we have had indeed a lot of very harif conversations, but something wonderful happened as a result of my statement, because once I made that statement, the others stopped condemning us in public. And my point of view is, we need to be proud for what we stand for. We need to define ourselves in terms of what we're proud of within ourselves and not to define ourselves according to what we are against. That's a weakness of human character. Mm. And through scoring runs for our own team, through magnifying what we stand for, for saying we believe that we have the authentic, true religious tradition that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has gifted us without referring negatively to others, that's the best way to move forward. And if others want to present themselves in that way, <laughs> and there is a particular model that I use. It's attributed to Harav Cook, but my my um, research reveals that perhaps he didn't say it. But it's it's the example of the symphony orchestra. So in the symphony orchestra, you've got different instruments. Each one makes its unique sound, but under the baton of the conductor, they produce beautiful harmony together. And that must be the way that Tamidei Chachamim Arbim Shalom Ba'olam, the way we are Marbe Shalom is not by not having arguments, but So uh, we need to leave the space for others to be able to express themselves in their way. We need to respect them for that. And under the baton of human coexistence, we can produce harmony. Marbe Shalom. The Shalom we have is through Machloket. It's not through agreeing to everything that others say. That that machloket is l'shem shemaim because we respect the people concerned, and uh, and respect their right to express themselves in the way they wish to. Wow, 
in the same way that Israel has a Sephardic chief rabbi, an Ashkenazi chief rabbi, has there ever been a push in the United Kingdom to say, well, you're the Orthodox chief rabbi, but we want to have a, a more liberal chief rabbi in, as well? So I am officially the chief rabbi of the United Hebrew Congregations of the Commonwealth. So officially, that's Great Britain and another 52 countries. Okay, enormous, mega. Right, so basically, I wow. delegate my authority in Australia, New Zealand, and Canada, and, and India, and Pakistan to, to various others, and each has its own mindset. And I only hear from these countries when they're in real trouble. At one point, the United States, correct? I mean, we were, were we part of yeah, the United Kingdom? Not part of the Commonwealth. Oh. <laughs> yeah, we gave birth to you, but, but uh, you're, you're not part of the Commonwealth. So, and by the way, I, I'm not asking for it. <laughs> <laughs> More than enough. Absolutely. But in reality, at a practical level, I'm responsible for um, the United Hebrew Congregations of, of, of Great Britain, and that amounts to mainstream orthodoxy. So many within Haredi circles would have their rabbis, and they would not look to me to be their official uh, rav. And certainly in the non-orthodox world, they don't look to me. And I genuinely believe that with the rav, we need to earn respect. We need to show that it's not just because we've received something uh, as a hereditary uh, factor or because we have a title that we need to have that respect. We need to earn it. We need to show that our leadership is something worthwhile to follow. And uh, Baruch Hashem, what we've always had in the United Kingdom has been towering chief rabbis who have gained the respect of all sectors of Judaism because of the leadership that they have shown. And I've been particularly wow. blessed to be a fly on the wall to see the wonderful leadership of Chief Rabbi Emanuel Jakobowitz and also Chief Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, both of whom were outstanding ambassadors of Klal Yisrael. Um, now, of course, there's politics, and of course, there are those who are vying for positions and equal opportunities of leadership. Uh, but there are ways of dealing with it. And when one engages in situations uh, with Darke Shalom, I think that uh, we can actually achieve a harmonious way of moving forward. And Baruch Hashem, that's what we've been blessed with. Is, first of all, it's a perfect segue because I wanted to ask, the, the chief rabbi follows this distinguished line of chief rabbis, which I imagine when, when recruited and installed in that position can be somewhat intimidating. We had the privilege of having a very wonderful relationship with Chief Rabbi Sachs, who came to our community several times, and Lady Jacobowitz came to our community and spent a Shabbos here. It, it can be, I imagine, intimidating. And of course, Chief Rabbi Mervis has, has contributed in extraordinary ways. In no way do I mean to compare or diminish. But I wonder for you, as you were installed and took the office, is it intimidating to say, where will I make my contribution? How can I distinguish myself minimally? How can I continue the wonderful work they did, given how extraordinary they were? So it's an enormous zuchot for me to occupy the position that I occupy. And extraordinarily, since 1704, I'm only the 11th chief rabbi. Mm, wow. So that's wow. quite amazing. And here on the wall, wall alongside me, but you don't see it, I've got the either photographs or portraits of my 10 predecessors, and that's it. Um, and, and the weight of, of history rests very heavily on my shoulders. Um, but, you know, every generation needs its own leadership and its own style. Um, I don't find it, find it intimidating at all. I find that I'm enormously blessed uh, to have, have them in situ and for me to have the opportunity to build on uh, their successes. And you know, there's a tefillah which I continuously save. And in Sachem Vesechel Tov Bnei Elokim V'Adam, it's a pasuk in the Mishle, Bnei Elokim V'Adam. First, we have to find grace and favor in the eyes of a Kodesh Baruch Hu, and only afterwards we should seek to be popular in the view of people. And if everything we do has a Kodesh Baruch Hu in mind, um, says, uh, then we'll be able to take the courageous decisions that we need to take um, to have, uh, hopefully, responsible leadership uh, and conviction leadership that, that one needs in a position such as this. So we need an enormous amount of uh, Siata Dishmaya. And those who came before me bless me always because I'm able to learn from their experiences. 
does, how does the chief rabbi deal with, you know, on a much smaller scale as, as rabbis and, and public leaders, we also deal with this and, and always can use chizak. How does the chief rabbi not become distracted or brought down by criticism? There's so little criticism of the chief rabbi, but for the denominations or segments, and it's hard to navigate. We live in such complicated times and people wish you were more outspoken about this or less outspoken about that or showing more leadership on this controversial issue or taking a position on that. And I'm sure the chief rabbi gets emails or texts or personal uh, in encounters where people offer their unsolicited feedback and criticism. How does the chief rabbi not allow that to bring him down, weigh him down or be distracted from the, the mission? I think that's an ongoing issue for all rabbinim in whatever uh, capacity we, we serve our communities and certainly for me in my position, I live in one of the world's biggest uh, fishbowls and, uh, you know, constantly people are talking and commenting and uh, and it's fine. It's okay because actually such a stage provides us with an enormous opportunity for the potential of Kiddush Hashem. That if uh, one is being noticed, then Imritzei Hashem, may we be blessed to have a positive impact uh, on others. Um, I think when it comes to criticism, the first question we have to ask is, are they right or are they wrong? And we need to be courageous enough often to acknowledge maybe we didn't make the best decision or maybe we did. Uh, um, nobody is perfect. <clears throat> and when one reaches a decision and we reach the decision, not just at whim, but because one has consulted, one has read up, one has taken the advice. Um, you know, Akadosh Baruch Hu said at the time of creation, Nase Adam Betzalmenu why in the plural? Because Akadosh Baruch Hu was Mitya'itz with the Malachi Asharet, in order to teach us, even though he didn't need to, so too, whatever the decisions we take, we need to consult. And that's a crucially important matter. And particularly with very important and critical decisions, one needs to know that one is hopefully doing the right thing and, and to act with humility, certainly courage, but also humility. And when one feels that one is doing the absolutely right thing for Klal Yisrael, it's absolutely fine. Any criticism that comes one's way, okay, it happens. Uh, obviously, one shouldn't be foolish to take decisions where the criticism will come from the majority of Klal Yisrael. You know, we, we have to bear in mind outstanding and and also, there's, there's a lovely lesson that I always bear in mind, and that is to be a, a great leader, you need to be one step ahead of your followers. To be a poor leader, you will be two steps ahead of them. Be one step ahead. Say acharai. Hmm. Set an example. Don't sit in your seat to occupy the positions that they want you to. Don't allow your followers to lead you. You must be there to lead them. Be one step ahead. But if you're two steps ahead, if you're too far ahead and they can't grasp what you are about and they don't get it and you haven't brought them into your confidence, then they're going to criticize. They might even rebel. So one needs a lot of seichel and most of all, one needs the other dishma. Are you able to be in touch with the other chief rabbis in, in around the world because they are in similar circumstances as you are? I don't think that any two chief rabbis are in are in similar circumstances. Some of us are in quite comparable circumstances. Um, so, for example, I do have some very close connections. Uh, chief Rabbi Chaim Korsia of, of France is a close friend and colleague of mine, and 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 we're in touch regularly. Uh, chief Rabbi Ricardo de Seni of of Rome. Um, there are many others. Uh, whom we uh, engage with uh, continuously, together with senior rabbis who don't have the title chief rabbi, right. Rashi Yeshiva and, and, and others uh, from whom we always have to gain knowledge, advice and inspiration. How, how, did, how did not only the chief rabbi's life change from going from a, a local rabbi to the chief rabbi, but the family of the chief rabbi? Is it hard for, for the family to now have that level spotlight or be exposed to that criticism? And, and in what ways did becoming chief rabbi, in what ways did they meet your expectations? In what ways did they surpass? Meaning, did you discover things about being chief rabbi that you never dreamt of and other parts of chief rabbi that, that you didn't know and you wish wouldn't be? So I've been blessed because 
I'm now the chief rabbi for a second time. When I was mm. 28 years old, I was elected to become chief rabbi of Ireland. Um, and uh, I had arrived in Ireland at the age of 25, was the rabbi of a kehila there, which was my first position in the rabbinate. And the chief rabbinate of Ireland is a very historic one. Chief Rabbi Herzog had, had been the chief rabbi, Chief Rabbi Chakobovitz had been the chief rabbi, together with other distinguished rabbis. And I, Ireland at the time, when I was chief rabbi, was a relatively small but still dynamic community with a full infrastructure um, of Jewish institutions. Um, and there was an absence of an Israeli uh, representative because uh, there, were, there were no political ties between Ireland and Israel at the time uh, as a result of the influence of the Vatican over Ireland at the time. So I had an enormous amount of experience of representing the Jewish community of Ireland at the highest possible political level and also representing Israel's interests. Um, and therefore, that experience of being Chief Rabbi of Ireland for eight years uh, prepared me well for my current experience. Um, and I think most of all, as being chief rabbi, it's very much like being a rav. You've got responsibility. You've got people you need to work with. You've got the nudniks. And having an Eze Kenegdo is a crucially important element of everything that we do. And I owe so much uh, to my rabbanit, uh, who is a, a wonderful partner of mine in everything uh, that we do. She's somebody in her own right. She works full time as a senior social worker. And at the same time, she and I are, are very much partners in, in the spiritual leadership of the community. And we're blessed by Ruch Hashem with the most wonderful children who are a great support to us uh, at all times. Wow. You know, I'm just wondering when it comes to, to Aliyah, you know, as rabbis here in the United States. So we encourage people to make Aliyah. Rabbi Goldberg always says, if you're not making Aliyah for any legitimate reason, you should at least struggle with the... With the with not the, not the, if, but when. No, not, not if, but when. So so the question is, we're, we're, we don't have any official connection to, to the government in the United States, but does, does the chief rabbi's relationship to the government, does that become a little complicated? I represent the Jews living in the United Kingdom. How do I encourage them to leave the United Kingdom? So it's a great question. It's an ongoing dilemma, and it and it's a dilemma which comes from a good place. Baruch Hashem that we have the opportunity to make Aliyah in our time, and that we have Medinat Israel to be a great source of inspiration. And uh, we're also uh, in a better position than you are because to hop over to Israel, it's four and a half hours as opposed to a much longer journey, and we've very much take advantage of that and within our communities we are blessed to have children and grandchildren who are living in israel we're exceptionally proud of that uh, many of us myself included have children who've served in sahal and um israel is is very much a central element of our jewish faith and of our jewish life within political circles my experience is that those who are not anti-semites get it they understand right. we have a special connection with the country called Israel and at the same time we are fully fledged integrated British citizens proud of our British identity and there is no conflict of identity um, those who start off at the starting point of not being um, well disposed towards us uh, find problems with that um, but certainly um, we are blessed to be able to be British, enjoy British society, to be fully included within British society. We have had British Jews at the highest possible level of British society. Um, and, uh, you know, we on a few occasions, we nearly had a, a Jewish prime minister. Uh, they lost the elections. Next time round, uh, if Labour wins the election next year, then uh, we'll have a Jewish prime minister's wife. Um, and. The nation wow. doesn't bat an eyelid over it and, and is fully inclusive of people. And currently we've got a Hindu prime minister um, and it's not an issue with regard to his leadership. So Chief Rabbi, we've spoken about the past um, and we've spoken about the present. Let's talk a little bit about the future. Um, none of us have a crystal ball, but but for, for a significant amount of time already, I remember 
many have been very pessimistic of the future of, of UK or British Jewry, the rise of anti-Semitism, Jeremy Corbyn, even, even within parliament of factors, factions of it. Um, are, are, is the chief rabbi optimistic, pessimistic? Are we seeing a spike in anti-Semitism? I, I will say as an American, for a long time, we felt safe and secure and pointed our finger at Europe and England, wondering why any Jews would remain there and are they out of their mind? There's no future to Jews in France and in England. What are they still doing there? Why don't they see that? And now we've seen these last couple of years, of course, this spike and significant rise, not only in anti-Semitism on the streets, but in our own equivalent of parliament in our own Congress with Rashida Tlaib's recent uh, Nakba event and, and so on. So it turns out, you know, when you live in a glass house, don't don't throw stones and don't point fingers. There's, there's several pointing back at you. So is the chief rabbi optimistic, pessimistic of the future for Jewry in the UK and in America for that for that matter? Well, let me speak about the UK. I, I leave America up to you. <laughs> um, I'm very optimistic. Baruch Hashem. We've got a great Jewish community here. Um, the UK is one of the only countries outside of Israel which is seeing a growth in the Jewish population year on year. Chinuch uh, is extraordinary. We now have reached the 70% mark of all Jewish children attending schools. Wow. Um, the, across the board, primary wow. school and secondary school are wow. in Jewish education. Um, wonderful shuls representing all uh, different hashkofas, uh, great kashrut facilities, social and cultural uh, facilities. Um, Anti-Semitism is a growing problem. And you'll be aware of the years of the Jeremy Corbyn leadership of the Labour, Labour Party and how that problem became exacerbated in the UK. And Baruch Hashem, we were able to contribute to the neutralizing of that problem. It hasn't gone away, but certainly Baruch Hashem, uh, we have been blessed that it didn't enable a labor at the time uh, to lead the country. So we are here with our eyes open. Um, and with all that, Baruch Hashem, we are blessed. Um, and it, we are so blessed to have Medinat Israel today and to be able to receive inspiration and, and guidance and to have that Kesher as well. And, and we always encourage Aliyah. But for those who choose to live in this country, Bezrat Hashem, may we have a great future. Wow. Wow. That's great. Is there any special initiatives that you're working on right now for the, for the future of the uh, Jewish community? Many. <laughs> um, so I, I don't know where to start and, and what to highlight. Uh, we are very active in the area of uh, interfaith activity. Hello, are you still with me? I'm still with you. I guess Rebecca okay, Goldberg just dropped my, off. My screen has changed. Yeah. Um, so Baruch Hashem uh, at interfaith level, um, I am proactively involved at the highest global level in terms of Jewish Muslim relations. And the Abraham Accords have opened windows of opportunity for us within the Middle East, which we are uh, grasping hold of with both hands. And there are some very exciting developments in that uh, entire area. Um, within our own communities, we uh, developed what we call Project Welcome post-pandemic to guarantee that our numbers of people coming to our mainstream shuls should be at the very least as many as those who are coming pre-pandemic and we're doing Baruch Hashem well in that regard. It's an enormous challenge, as I know is the case in communities right around the world, but Baruch Hashem, we are indeed uh, doing well. We have numerous specific programs relating to education. That's informal education. I have a department in my office called the Center for Community Excellence, for which I've raised significant sums so that my office can fund uh, programs in shuls to qualify for the funding. It has to be a chiddush, something that has never been done before. So, for example, coming up to Shavuot, we have 25 communities in the UK who are putting on Shavuot programs that they've never put, put on before. Um, and we need to be machadish all the time. Um, we have to be creative. Um, you know, uh, the Hebrew word for year is Shana. I don't have to tell you this, you know, 
Shana comes from Shinun, being repetitive because you're in and you're out. The calendar is the same. That's the Shana. But within the Shana, you've got the Chodesh. The, the months, which is Chodesh, an opportunity for Chidush. Baruch Hashem, the Shana for us is our Torah, it is our tradition, it is timeless, it's from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, eternally relevant. But within our Torah way of life, we have to have that element of Chidush in terms of our presentation, making it fresh, making it relevant. It's exactly what you've been doing in Boca Raton, um, and uh, which uh, I, I applaud you so much for. You're, you're world leaders at a programming level, how you have transformed a, a community. And we're trying to emulate what you have achieved here in the UK. Uh, and we must never, ever be complacent. Um, you know, I always speak about the three great challenges of the Jewish people today, and they are the three A's. They all start with the letter A, anti-Semitism, assimilation, and apathy. The first two, are visible the third one is hidden apathy is the top challenge we have we cannot be complacent we need hitlavut we need passion we need to be proactive dreaming up and actually activating new systems new activities new programs in order that emir Hashem we should move forward Chief Rabbi, it's been a tremendous honor and uh, we're grateful for your not only conversation today but your leadership and vision which spreads far beyond the UK and, and the responsibilities. The How many countries are in the Commonwealth? 52 at the last count. It changes. 52. And does the chief rabbi travel? Does does he visit the other direct uh, interactions and responsibilities to those 52 countries? So I, I can only do what, I, what I'm humanly capable of. As I mentioned before, we delegate and each Kahila has its own dynamic and I know which of Din and which rabbi and which authority looks after things on, on our behalf. And uh, some of the communities uh, take our leadership very seriously, particularly in Australia and New Zealand. In India now, we have a strong connection and in various other uh, Commonwealth countries, some of which are in Africa, which have some deep issues at the time. But if you take a Commonwealth country such as Canada, they don't need me. <laughs> totally the UK. Baruch Hashem, they're, they're terrific. But we still have connections and and uh, formal activities. Um, so uh, it's an enormous achrayot uh, and, and a great schut. Well, we thank you for, for that vision, for the leadership, for the efforts. We learned so much and, and much will continue to put wow. into practice. So thank you for sharing with us about the coronation and about and about so much more. Great pleasure and a huge yeshachach to you and for everything you're doing. Thank you. Rabbi Brody, that is Chief Rabbi Sir Ephraim Mervis, the current Chief Rabbi of the United Hebrew Congregations of the Commonwealth. And you heard how many countries are under the Commonwealth. It's really pretty extraordinary. Rabbi Brody there? Rabbi Brody. Rabbi Brody there? Can you hear? We are back. Rabbi Brody's mic is still not on. He's muted, but he's coming back any second right now. He has changed locations. We're talking here. about we are back. Brothers in the Commonwealth. He is back. Oh, oh my gosh. gosh. How many countries, how many Jews, how many people, and, and what a vision, and what a mensch, and what a sweet, sweet neshama the chief rabbi is. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but it comes across the sweetness and how genuine he is. So it was a real honor to have him. We love him, and he's an incredible, inspiring uh, character. He's, uh, he's definitely doing some great things. Can't wait to see him It's interesting the country is chief rabbis, right? United K Commonwealth. And uh, I, I spoke recently, I met with Rabbi uh, Goldstein of uh, South Africa, Chief Rabbi South Africa. Exciting right. things to come. We're going to hopefully partner on something we're really excited about. So you got Chief South Rabbi Africa's Rabbi. got a Chief Rabbi, and right. the United Kingdom's got a Chief Rabbi, Ireland's got a Chief Rabbi, France has a Chief Rabbi. Does Australia United have a Chief States Rabbi? Yes, they did. United States actually had a Chief Rabbi. It had for a very short time a Chief Rabbi. Very short Wasn't time. It's all Rabbi Francis. It's not Rabbi, Rabbi, Rabbi Joseph, RJJ, yeah, Rabbi Yaakov RJ, Yosef. RJJ. Yeah. And it basically yeah. killed him being the chief rabbi, right? Yeah. But maybe it's time to bring it back. But those countries are are all the Orthodox community has an infrastructure. Like he was talking about all the couples who got married under his auspices who opened right. a file with his office. Yeah, I saw you were excited so, with that. No, I'm saying it's all centralized Beautiful. and there's something to be said about that. The intermarriage yeah. rates are so much less and the assimilation. You could speak about South Africa. South Africa where 
I think the majority are not observant, but the non-observant still identify with the Orthodox or observant community, and they still function in terms of their marriages and registrations and conversion and everything is still done in that way. So because of all that, the intermarriage numbers are much, much lower, aren't they? Yeah, it is. And it's funny because I remember going to shul in South Africa growing up with my father. We would go Friday night. We'd go, uh, I was in the choir back in the day. I was in the choir in uh, the garden shul. Yeah. And uh, we would go to shul there. But most people wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't uh, walk. Most people were driving. But it was an Orthodox shul, and that yeah. all the shuls there were Orthodox. There was nothing. There was really nothing else. Structure entirely yeah. differently. Entirely yeah. different. They're very, very different. And but the, what he said about seventy percent of the children in his community are in day schools. I mean, that's incredible. Yeah. What a statistic. That's a huge number. By the I mean, way, I, this thing I want to say from a member of our community, Lavana Amano. Look what she writes. Beeras could teach the world about Achtas. I lived in France and England, the Passaic in New Jersey, and Lakewood, and finally Boca. I never saw such Achtas and balanced places as our Beeras in Boca. So, Levana, wow. thank you. Thank you for watching, Levana. Thank you for writing that. Appreciate that. It means the world to us. That means the that, world that to is, us. That is special. That is so special. I just saw something. You know, you were talking about your shirim for uh, for Shavuos and the theme of love. And, you know, I don't know if you just saw what hit the hit the wire right now. It's kind of timely with a lot of your top, with the names of your topics. Yeah. yeah. Certain singer who passed away? Certain singer just passed away. A lot of a lot of the, the names of your, of your shirim, you know, might have been... <laughs> Could be. Could be. Could, could be. be. Could not, it could be a coincidence, I'm just saying. Could be. But, could uh, be. Yeah, just saw that right now. It's like, wow, were we just talking about that? Do you know but, that, uh, that do you know that Orthodox Jews are 0.02% of the population? Sorry, 0.2% of the population. Orthodox Jews are 0.2% of the population, but 20% of altruistic kidney donors in America? That's great. Yeah, I remember that statistic this past Shabbos. I mean, that's we had a great Shabbos in the yeah. yeah. We celebrated the many members, many, I say many. Many because more than one is many who've generously donated their kidneys to crazy. total strangers. What right. a what a weekend. And we have a member, a couple members who received kidneys whose lives were saved. They're only alive today because they got a kidney. Would you do it if you got matched? Like if you I can't thought about it. this already? I can't. Oh, I tried. Can't, I tried yeah. to get swabbed. I've got certain health issues. Uh -huh. I know, I know I look like I'm the perfect specimen of health. Yeah. And I feel great, I got to tell you. But the rabbinate has given me wonderful gifts, including them things that preclude me from being a kidney donor. But my wife was so blown away by the weekend, so excited by it. She's in. Motzei Shabbos, when one of our own, Dr. Danny Agion, brain surgeon, donated his kidney and had never met the recipient. And Motzei Shabbos at the Eitan Katz concert at our shul, the parents of his recipient came up and expressed their endless gratitude. And what a moment. What a moment. Brought everyone to tears. It was unbelievable. So my wife was home. She swabbed Sunday morning. And you know what she said to me? I actually wrote about it in my article this week. Everyone yeah. could check it out on our website. But she said to me, she comes and she goes, I said, what's the matter? She goes, you know, I never win anything. I never get picked for anything. I'm sure I'm not going to be a match. And I was like, wouldn't that be great? Like you swabbed, you did your part. And if you don't match, you don't have to have surgery and give up a kidney. Right. And I don't have to drive right. carpool for a couple of weeks. So like, you'll feel you did your part. She's like, are you kidding me? I desperately want to match. Like, how long do you think? And within a couple of days, maybe they'll call. But I never win, so probably not. They never pick me. That's what makes her special. But but she's also not special. She's very special. But she's not special in that the whole weekend was so inspiring that I think that was the sentiment so many people had, which was did like- she get, I thought you were going to say she got called. No, 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 not yet. Right. But um, I did ask Renewal whether they would cover the carpool if she, right. got, if she was a match. <laughs> it's actually really funny because I think D Danny Agion, the doctor, said that he's not- by nature a giver i think by by nature a lot of us are selfish right. and he did it because he just wants to to kind of make him the type of person that wants to give i thought that was my article this week and i told a few stories in there about who's really the donor and who's the recipient because uh -huh. the donors will tell you they got more than they gave and the recipients they gave the donor the opportunity to find this meaning and purpose so kidney donation or transplant is an extreme example but the truth is every time we do something nice or kind or share our resources or time Who's the giver? Who's the taker? Who's the donor? Who's the recipient? It's a big Shavuos lesson from Rus in that. Really? So Interesting. Check out the article from Are there other now. parts of our body that we can donate or kidneys are really yeah, the only course. thing? Liver. No, I'm saying while we're alive. I'm saying like while we're... Liver. You can donate your liver. Corneas, corneas or retinas. Um, yeah, I think there are other... There are other there's the whole yeah. question of brain death is brain death death and therefore alive... No, I'm saying if I'm alive right now and right. I match, can I? I can't give someone my heart because I'm going to die. No, definitely so like, can't. Like, kidney's the major one. Kidney's the major. Okay. And we, yeah, we had a thing, and we've taken over that. Like, like the 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 Jewish 20%. world is now. Wow. 
It was an interesting question that one of our members stopped me on Sunday at a wedding. Sunday? I forgot when. And he said, you know, it's beautiful. The weekend blew me away. Super amazing. He's a physician too. He said, but there is one thing that troubled me. And he said, you know, we're taking care of our own. Like maybe all these Orthodox Jews don't any kidneys because they essentially go to Jews. So maybe they should uh -huh. be giving to non-Jews. But I wasn't bothered by it as much because I felt – you know, we we donate money to Jewish causes disproportionately to non-Jewish because this is a, right. I'd give my brother a kidney, but maybe not a stranger. So the Jewish people are all our brother. I like that. So I think people oh, take care of their family and their own, and it's sort of reflective of how we're supposed to feel. Again, going into Shavuos, Kishichad, Belevachad, we're one people, unity, and all that. I love it. Actually, yeah. really excited about Shavuos. And by the way, I really, I just counted uh, Svira. And I'm, I'm nice. pretty sure I counted. I remember last night I counted. So I just finished. Baruch Hashem. <laughs> so yeah, you got it. 49, yeah, seven weeks. And, and, all the way and, there. I, and I do want to give credit this year to the OU. The OU's nightly email reminder definitely helped. Nice. So, well, speaking of the OU, I'm, uh, I'm going to New York for a wedding next week. One of our great teachers, Rabbi Sugarman, is making another wedding. And uh, the next night I'm staying because I'm very excited. With the OU, we're partnering. Boca Raton mm -hmm. Synagogue and our podcast Behind the Shadow. Be, out of the shadows, Boker. Let's try that again. Boker Tone Synagogue and Out of the Shadows are partnering with the OU, and we're doing a mental health May is Mental Health Month, and we're doing in in Lawrence in the Five Towns with Rabbi Trump at, at Young Israel Lawrence Cedarhurst. Uh, Dr. Norman Blumenthal and I will be doing a panel discussion on mental health, and I think wow. others as well. So I'm looking forward. That's, that's next crazy. Wednesday night to our global community in the New York area. You are. It's not being streamed, but you're more than invited in person. We'd love to see you there. And if you want us to bring behind the Bema to Lawrence Cedarhurst to some fun place, we'll bring, bring behind the Bema on the road too. <laughs> could do that. We could do that. Brody, close us out. Any That's thoughts? What are, you, what are you teaching? What subject are you teaching on, on Shavuos? Oh, so I'm actually talking about what happens when you have in-laws that become either become or they're just not religious. They're not from. So what's the the obligation to to honor them as your uh, you know, to honor your loving in laws, loving in laws, or, lo lo or even your parents. Let's say they're not religious. What, what's the where you'd say it's obvious that your parents keep it up, aim, but it's, okay, there's questions. It's, it's not so simple, and let's try and understand what the what the challenges what's are. Not, what's what would you be teaching in? So I I love it. I am to me it's the favorite slot. It, it might not be a lot of people at the five a.m. slot or four thirty, whatever it might be, but the people that are there are are there for a reason. Most it's the coveted, the coveted 4:30 a.m. slot. But yeah, there's a good chance that half of the, you know, let's say there's five people, so two might be sleeping. But now you're giving you the, it, but you are giving it this year for the first time, a second time as well, a right? Second, exactly. We're doing an 8 a.m. slot on the second day, so we get a rerun, and anyone can come and join that global community. If you want to come hang out in Boca for Shavuos, we got a lot of great stuff happening. We did but, that several over in Moscow. It's you, and me. We're we're teaching the subject a couple times. Some people can't make it up through the night, so. You know, we've got yeah, learning night, day, afternoon, Just all, doing all around it. the clock. Yeah. But I'll do, I will say, that, I mean, when, when you start out, it was night, uh, 11 p.m. or midnight, I think you have an 11, 8, 11 p.m. 11, 15, right? whatever time so it like, is. Let's say it's a pretty popular share. Get a, get a couple more than just a handful of people there. But um, what was I going to say? <laughs> I have no <laughs> idea. Where I was going. By, by 4.30 a.m. But uh, yeah, four thirty a.m. Might, might not be a lot of it might not be a lot of people, but you know, we, we got it going. Oh, there's, oh really? I was going to say. Oh, I know what it is. You, you, when you, when you do, it's probably a little bit of pressure because there's a lot of people there. Let's just say the four thirty sheets here. It's not a lot of pressure, and, and you know, let's just say not a lot of questions. <laughs> there are some some advantages to that slot, I guess. <laughs> some advantage. Like okay, I, I, I'm preparing. Believe I'm preparing as like it would be 50 people there, but it, you know, whatever it is, it is what it's it not, is. You know, listen, it's quality, not quantity. It's quality, quality. Exactly. exactly. It's all about the quality. It's well, congratulations, Mazel Tov, on another beautiful Unity Night, Unity program tonight. Really proud of our community. Come together, Jews of every type, on the eve of Shavuos, Jews of every background sitting together. No politics, no disagreements. Yeah. Just Torah. Just Torah. Who produced that Torah that we learned? Can't tell you. Oh, I did it in partnership with others. Yeah, it's a okay. it's a it's a closely guarded. It's like the Coke recipe. But all traditional Torah sources. It's all, all exactly, and that's the key. It's just if you keep it traditional, there's no one's going to argue on the on the original. No pushing the envelope. Stuff. There was there was no pushing nah, the envelope. Well, you don't like need that. to. You don't need to push the envelope. It's so funny because one lady actually called me last night and she said it's a little put off because on the questionnaire there's three questions: your age bracket, 
um, how you identify as a, as a, as a Jew, reformed, conservative, orthodox, unaffiliated. She says, I felt a little, a uh, little put off. I said, well, how else do you want me to be able to understand who, who's coming to the table? I got to, I said, I want to ask if you're politically, you know, conservative right. or, or liberal. So like the Yankees or the Mets. Yeah. yeah. So, so I'm just trying to, it's the only way I can do it. And then someone else called me later and they're like, they're like, yeah, but I don't think any Orthodox Jews are going to show up at a program like this. They, so they said, it's all going to be, you know, the, the, the Orthodox Jews aren't interested in joining with another, another denomination and, 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 and other Jews. So I said, no, actually it's about 50% Orthodox. Said, How can you prove that? I said, because I actually have <laughs> the forms that everyone filled out yeah. who they are. I know it's, it's, it's a lot of Orthodox. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Do you know that back in, the, back in the day, back yeah. in the day, Dr. J. Keen and I, handful of people, we ran singles events. We called it the Jewish Singles Network. And we ran all from Florida, from Palm Beach all the way down to Keys. I remember. And we I said, remember you know, instead of each community just having things for singles by itself, let's bring the community together. And one of the things we did, we rented out the Diplomat Ballroom, the Diplomat Hotel, and we had a massive speed dating. And we made it two age groups. I don't remember, 30 to 50 and, right. and 51 to 7. I don't remember exactly the age groups. And then three denominations, which we made up better names like tradition, but essentially reform conservative orthodox. To, so six groups of speed dating and they got closed out. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Huge turnout was incredible. So I remember this woman called and she's like, I want to sign up for the, um, for the reform group in this age group. I'm like, I'm so sorry. That's closed out. She goes, you know, I, I really grew up more conservative. <laughs> so put me in the conservative. Yeah. And so I'm so sorry. That one's also closed out. She goes, you know, <laughs> I've always seen myself as becoming more observant. I'm open to be, you know what? Put me oh, in the observant right. one. Right. So, you know, for, for, for the sake of dating, you never know what people are willing you to try know. out. Oh, it's gosh. amazing. It's amazing. So, Mazel Tov on another beautiful night, Uni Night. We want to wish all of our uh, our wonderful listeners and uh, people on this fun journey of Behind the Bima. Stay happy, stay healthy, stay holy. It should be a beautiful Shavuos, a beautiful Kabbalah right. Satora. We should receive the Torah. And uh, we should do it hand in hand, united together. Yad Please, plus Yad equals you did, which is Koach. Unbelievable. Take care, everybody. Have a happy, beautiful Shavuos. A good Yantif.